Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. We invite you to like us on Facebook, The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness, where you can download all of our messages or email us at avoc at gmail.com and request the message to be emailed. Our speaker is Brother Courtney Jackson. Courtney Jackson, we thank you so much for coming on the call with us. The time is now yours. It's always a privilege and honor to be on to study God's Word. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and we'll go right into our message. Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we thank you again for the opportunity to study thy Word. We ask your blessing as we look at the last generation. Let it be that our sins will be covered by the blood of Jesus, that we might have your Holy Spirit in order to be prepared to be this people uh, that you have intended to produce through the remnant church and the three angels' message. This is our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. We've been studying the last generation, and our scripture is based on Romans 8. I'll be reading from verse 14 to verse 19. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again, to fear. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That was Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 19. The last generation is a inevitable uh, occurrence in some form or manner. And so the manner in, in that it occurs is something that we really need to grasp. And in this latter portion, because we are now uh, really at the the peak of this study, and we should finish it in its totality shortly, if not this time, maybe in our next presentation. The This is a prophecy, and God has promised his people that there would be a last generation just simply based on the second coming of Christ. So the manner the condition, better said, the circumstances, the atmosphere of the world, politically, religiously, culturally, secularly, 
all of these things will have to be considered in relation to the experience of the people who are going to give that loud cry of Revelation 18, 1 to 4, Revelation 10, verse 7, who will participate in the mystery of God being finished, which according to Timothy and Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory, without controversy, without controversy, God manifests in the flesh, yes, in my flesh and your flesh and the flesh of the other brothers and sisters in the remnant movement. And so when we understand the ramifications of this, fear God and give glory to Him for now is the time that judge, that God will be judged before the whole universe. With the devil with his angels, with the holy angels, with the unfallen world, but then especially with mankind. Fallen, deceived, deluded, rebellious, having gone with Satan. But God needs to answer the argument, the controversy, that somehow he was at fault in one of two ways especially. One... He created inferior beings, specifically the highest created being, Lucifer. If he can get that charge to stick, all he's been fighting for in the last 6,000 years, he can regain and then some. Because then he can go back to heaven, the devil that he is, the supreme demon that he is, and take up his position in the government of God, and or simply have his own kingdom over the universe and be the God of the universe. And so God, in a sense, has been handcuffed. And he had to allow a demonstration of the devil's principles so that what he knows, what he knew, but he did not want his created beings to experience, they would see. Because God is not, and I told you so, God, simply, to ridicule or to throw something back in somebody's face. No, that's not his way. His way is a way of compassion and gentleness, meekness and love. And he does say, follow me, if you want to. It's a decision you must make. But God has allowed the devil to come on the stage and we can look all around the world and we can see the character of the servants of sin, the servants of Satan, and we can look. It's a lot harder to find. But with close examination, we can find out who the servants of righteousness are, the sons of God the servants of God, the sons of God being equal, Romans six twenty two twenty three, 23, servants of God are without sin in the midst of a world given over to deception, delusion, and rebellion. But in the midst of all of that, with the horrific, constant, Temptations and harassment, satanic harassment, cultural pressure, worldly pressure, peer pressure, economic pressure, health issues of people that live like God. And who is the only God? The God of heaven, Jehovah, from everlasting to everlasting, who can only be described in certain parameters, holy pure, perfect, nothing that he does is harmful. Even though, even though God himself has allowed circumstances and situations, he has placed himself in. He has responded in a manner that it can only be said, wow, the patience, the love, the gentleness, the meekness, the goodness of God. 
And he's going to show that. He's going to manifest that in human flesh. The question, sister. The question, brother. Do you believe? If I didn't say it already, the picture I just painted, only an almighty, omnipotent God can do that. And that's what God has titled himself. And he's saying, you can believe in me or you can believe in the devil who has substantially less power than I do. You choose. You can see the benefits of the lifestyle that I've asked. You can see the benefits of his lifestyle, of his kingdom. And so many ask the question, in the midst of all the atmospheric, political, pestilential, cultural pressures of the 21st century, where is God? Is there God? Why, why, why is all this happening? Some questions are being answered. But the most important one to you, sister, the most important one to you, brother, what side of the equation will you be on? Will you be in rebellion? Will you stay in delusion? Will you allow deception to confuse you? Or will you plead with the God of heaven, Father, send me the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name to teach me all things I need to be redeemed, to have a good life. That's the prayer I'm asking you to pray, whether you're Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, evolutionist, atheist, humanist, spiritist, animist, evangelical, Catholic, or some other religion. Just pray that simple prayer. Go on about your life just like it has been. I'm not asking you to change today. God will manifest himself to you. That's the power of Christianity. We have a God that hears, and you will see his hand. You will know his Holy Spirit. So now, you have a test. But let's take a look at why this test and finish our study on the last generation. Because we've been looking at prophecies where Jesus has said, I will return soon. We looked at least the last week, uh, two weeks ago or four weeks ago, we've looked at the children of Israel and the situation there with them and Canaan. And when we understand what God has allowed in the stories, of the Bible, he wanted us to see in written form, or I should say symbolic form, what he was going to do prophetically, especially in the last generation. And so we can know exactly what was going and what is going to happen in relation to our need to be redeemed. Now, when we go back to ancient Israel, and I'm going to go back to the last uh, section where we are, where we were a couple of weeks ago. We looked at Psalm 89. I'm going to Psalm 89. In Psalm 89, we're looking at uh, verse 46, which says. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? Those are the three questions we ended with. How long? We have showed that Jesus has said he will come soon. The prophets have said that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul... Peter, it has been said he will return soon. Jesus himself said, I come quickly. 
we see people scoffing and how come Jesus hasn't come and when I was a child, when I was a teenager, when I was an adult, when I was middle-aged and now I'm old and people say things like that and then that those generations are gone. We've got at least four generations in the remnant church that are gone. So what's going on? We have found out that the second coming of Christ is a conditional prophecy. And the question how long is answered by Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 24. There are two conditions to the second coming of Christ. And in Matthew 24, the Bible tells us clearly And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, the manifestation of the sons of God unto all nations. And then shall the end come. There has to be a preaching and there has to be a manifestation. The mystery of God finished. The 144,000 a covenant-keeping people. And then God has an argument against Satan, and he can look down from heaven and say, Lucifer, how is it I've given this world into your hand for a time, and yet there's a people who are keeping my commandments, all of them perfectly in the midst of, of the harassment, the temptations, the oppression, satanic, the pressures of culture, family, peer pressure, economic pressure. They've learned to depend wholly, singularly, only on me. And they put their faith in me, even though they can't see, they don't feel good, They don't feel like they're going to see the answer to their prayer in the next second. No, they endure. They're able to endure. And they keep the word of my testimony. And thus they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so this people stand as a demonstration to the world. Evidence, A, in the case of the great controversy, Satan against Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit, and God says, look here, these people keep my commandments. Where are they from? Every city, every country, every nation, island. And where were you, Lucifer, when you sinned? In a pure, perfect, holy environment with no examples of sin anywhere to be seen, and you sinned? And God shows there was no excuse for the sin, no need for the sin. Open and shut case. Oh, yeah. Today? Things might look cloudy for you, sister. Things might look dark for you, brother. That's why it's righteousness by faith. And we're saved by grace. But Jesus said, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And so these people have the testimony of Jesus. And so how long? God is waiting for his people. Do not be deceived, brother. Do not be deceived, sister. Hear me clearly. Jesus' return to the earth is not delayed because he has no power. He can't finish something not in his physiological deity and physiological body in heaven glorified along with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Oh, they could finish things except... They made a covenant, and they said, we'll have a people, 
and they will do the demonstration, but we will wait until they have faith, until they trust us, until they're fully surrendered by choice. And if they're rebellious, like ancient Israel, we'll let them die. But we'll wait, and their grandkids, who are wickeder and weaker and more susceptible to sin, and there's more harassment from the devil, and the devil's a better deceiver, and the temptations are more than just when we had Morris code and then the telephone and radio. Wow, what's going to come after Internet, email, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram? What's next? Who knows? It'll be worse. But if we don't do it, then that means our grandkids will do it. And if the grandkids point back and they say, I don't know what was wrong with my grandpa and my grandma, and man, they're so wicked. Yeah, they deserve to go to hell. The kids will say that. Who are in a wickeder, weaker generation. That is what is on the line today, brother. Today, sister, wake up. Trust God. Put your faith in God. And quit looking around at the world, at your family, at your culture, the economy, the politics, and put your eyes on Jesus. Because God has said himself, How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself? Forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? Apparently God's sitting in heaven, and yes, he has wrath. But he has complete control, unlike humans do when they're in sin. And he won't pour out his wrath until, until. And so that message, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Though you can't see God's people getting ready on an island somewhere, or another continent, in a mountain, in the jungle, in the desert, somebody's getting ready, you better get ready too, by faith. Be ready, affect the people around you, and then we can actually hasten the return of Jesus. But let's keep reading here. In Psalm 89, verse 47, what words these are in verse 47... Remember how short my time is. Remember, Lord, God of heaven, how short my time is. Psalm 89, 47. We're saying, when we pray that, Lord, in another psalm, he said, we have 70 years. That's just a lot of time to each individual. So if you start getting close to that time, you can't say, well, Lord, you know my time is short. Empower me. Help me. Quicken me to quicken and get my life ready, but also to help the other people around me. Make me a catalyst. Psalm eighty-nine forty-seven. Remember how short my time is. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? I know you didn't. So let's get the work finished. Verse 48. What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? The last generation. Verse 48 goes on to say, Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Selah. No, he can't, but Jesus can and will when we keep our part of the covenant. Verse 49 says, Lord, where are my, where are thy former loving kindnesses, which thou swearest unto David in thy truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of thy servant. How 
I do bear in my bosom the reproach of all the mighty people. My family, they're stronger than me. My culture, there's more of them than me. The traditions, ingrained. They're sacred. You can't change them. You speak against them and, wow, treason, blasphemy. And then another race on the other side of the street, the other side of the river, the other country, the other continent, mighty people, giant countries, billions of people. Psalm 89, 51, wherewith thine enemies have reproached, O Lord, wherewith they have reproached the footsteps of thine anointed. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen. Amen. So here we see this song, these questions. God has put it there for a reason. Now let's take a look at what I have seen as the main reason why we haven't finished the work. Because I hope you've been asking that question like, well, what is the reason? Because I hope you're saying right now, I'm ready. I want to finish the work and be translated and never die. This is what is being offered to you by God. He's saying, I want to give you a gift of having been born and being a human being that never, ever will die. Do you believe me? And there's Millions of people in the remnant church saying, no, 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 don't want to be saved, don't want to be translated. Craziness? Ludicrous? What are they, schizophrenic, psychotic? Like, wow, like, so, and why, why did you come to church? In the remnant church? In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Adventist people believe in the second coming of Christ imminently, quickly, by faith, meaning faith and works. James, we work and not go to church and sit on the pews. Don't sit on the pews, sister, and just give your tithe and your offering. And make sure you give your tithe and your offering. Don't hold it back. But then once you give your tithe and offering, God wants that hand that put the money in, and he wants those feet that walk to the church to go out into the field, the mission field, and work. And what the church members haven't realized is that by doing that work, it transforms you because you're imbibed with the Spirit of God, the holy angels are with you, they empower you, the Holy Spirit comes and impresses you, and this is how we develop the fruit of the Spirit. When we're developing the fruit of the Spirit, we're being filled up with the Holy Spirit. We cannot just pray, pray, pray. Wednesday night, Friday night, Sabbath, week of prayer, and get the Holy Spirit. We get the Holy Spirit by opening the Bible, praying, reading the Bible, reading the testimony, the spirit of prophecy, Ellen G. White's books too, and do what they say. Put them down, close them, get up off your knees, open your door, your closet door, then your house door, get in your car, go down the street, get on an airplane, get on a boat, get on a bus, and go be a worker for God. And this gospel shall be preached for a witness to all the world, not by people sitting and praying in a church and giving money in a church and letting someone else do the work. We have to work too. You have to work too. And people are avoiding the work and the experience. And in John chapter 12, Jesus 
in his final time with his disciples, was trying to bring the message home to them. He was at Simon's feast early in chapter 12. We have the betrayal plot. We have the fourth Passover of his gospel ministry, which is now A.D. 31, basically. The triumphal entry. He comes into the city and the people are spreading their coats. The son of David. Messiah is here. They were looking for a certain type of a king, a worldly ruler, but that wasn't the case. Now, interestingly enough, some people of the world came to seek Jesus. And these people in this story represent the whole world. And I say that because they're Greeks. And Greece, at one time was the world uh, superpower, just like now. English is the world. Business language. America superpower. But it's a representation of the world. John 12, verse 20, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast, The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of the Seda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and tell of Andrew, and again Andrew, and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come. The hour is come. John 12, 23 that the Son of Man should be glorified. Okay. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Because we know the biblical language is so consistent, we're about to find out about this glory Because potentially, this glory which God wants to give you, sister, He wants to give you, brother, you may have been avoiding it. Chances are, past 50%, you've been avoiding it. Because I know, more than half of the church have been avoiding it. And so if we avoid the glory of God, well, how can we be saved? How can we finish the work. If God's not glorified, then how can Revelation 18 verses 1 to 4 be fulfilled? And I saw another angel with great power and he lightened the earth with great power and what else did it say? Glory. So Jesus says, John twelve twenty three, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Okay, Jesus, what is that in the context? Verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He likes his job. He likes the school he's at. He likes his wife or she likes her husband. She likes her kids. She likes her greater family, cousins, aunts and uncles and culture Asia, Europe, Africa, the islands, the Americas. So much so, it's like she hates Jesus, or he hates Jesus, because we cling to those things and won't separate from them. And so Jesus had to say, he that loveth his life shall lose it. 
And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Oh, wow. So what does that really mean? John twelve twenty six. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Wow. So Jesus says, if we love our life, all those things I described, so much. And Jesus says, let him follow me. No, you can't have the job, the clothes, the sports, the entertainment, the money, the comfort, and luxury, and pride, and selfishness of the world, and follow Jesus. If any man serve me, verse 26, let him follow me and where I am. Now, that those words, where I am, Jesus is today sitting in the most holy place in heaven, next to God the Father. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Wow. Okay, let's stop there and jump to Revelation chapter 3. Just so we're clear as to where Jesus is right now. I spoke some words, but my words don't have power, folks. Except... That comes from the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, which in Revelation chapter 3, the Bible says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as also, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Wow. Can you understand, sister? Can you understand, brother? Why I'm saying people come to church and they don't want to glorify God and it's like it's ludicrous. It's, I mean, just absurd. Crazy. Sit on a throne? None of the United States, China, India, Brazil, Russia, little specks of dust. Not even the size of a grain of sand in comparison to the universe. People fighting over countries. Absurd. And God wants to give us the universe? Think it through. Think it through. Revelation chapter 1. John, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace, not wrath. Redemption, not hell fire. Not the lake of fire and eternal destruction and darkness. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings, plural S, One prince, 
Jesus of the kings, the redeemed of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings, plural, and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. We're in John 12. Sister, are you reading your Bible? Brother, are you reading your Bible with me as we study? John 12. Does verse 25 make sense now? He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor with his seat on the throne right next to us. But here's the point. After all that set up, verse 27, here's the reason why Jesus hasn't returned. Because, sister, I did say, people are coming into the church. Brother, I did say, people baptize in the church and they don't want to glorify God. And they say, no, we don't know. No, I don't want to go. I'm not going to do that. You've seen it with your own eyes. And you're looking at the scripture here. It's ludicrous, folks. Reality is in the Bible, not in the world. Keep your eyes in the Word and on Jesus and the Father and let the Holy Spirit impress you. John 12:27 says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? No, Father, no. I'm not going to the crucifix. I'm not going to go to the cross. I'm not going to Calvary. I'm not going to pray in Gethsemane. Let these sinners go to the lake of fire and die for themselves. I won't suffer and die for them. But Jesus says, John chapter 12, verse 27, Father, save me from this hour. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? He didn't say that. Last part of verse 27, but for this cause, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Folks, this is a big deal. The disciples didn't get it. And that's why they were so dejected. They could not understand the crucifixion. And the prophet of God, Ellen G. White, tells us over and over again, that if they had understood, it is not a temporal kingdom. It's not a kingdom to rule in the world. It's not for the honor and glory and money and power and fame and pride of the world. The glory of God is self-sacrifice for the benefit of everybody else around you. This lesson is so important. God repeats it and repeats it and repeats it and repeats all the way to the end of the Bible? Yes, because we can't go to heaven except we glorify God, except we learn this lesson. You cannot enter heaven without going through this. And that's why so many people aren't going to heaven, and that's why the church hasn't finished the work, because there's a bunch of people We say we're Christians and we don't do what we're supposed to do. Or maybe we say, well, let Johnny and Janie 
Let them go over there and do that. I'll give an offering and I'll just sit in church and pray for the Holy Spirit. No, you go and do the work. So you have the character of Jesus and not just the other people in a church. Because that leaves them leaves you out of heaven and them saved. Because if one person won't be saved or two won't be saved, two won't go. But if one person won't be saved and one will, God takes the one who's ready. And if it's a hundred people who won't do the work, he takes just one. He went to Sodom and Gomorrah. He only got out three people. Caleb and Joshua, only two people. Go into Canaan. Noah in the ark, only eight people. Whole world, only eight people? Yeah, sister, your family. Sure, I understand you love them, but you're going to pass up eternity? Dear brother, I know that's a good job, but you're going to give up eternity and a throne in heaven for a job and a car and a house and a woman? There's less than... So important that God basically says, you know what, I'm not going to finish the work without a people who choose to finish it with me, for me, and have faith in me, and who will live like me. I'm not going to force them. And I won't force the previous generations. I won't force you guys today. You choose this day, like Joshua said. You choose, sister. You choose, brother. And there's... It's singular. We're saved as individuals, not churches, not families, not culture groups, not people groups, not skin color, ethnicity, political party, socioeconomic stria. No. Individuals. Come to cross, come to the cross, take up your cross, come to Jesus by yourself. And if we look at the life of Jesus, and you look at what it just said here, except the corn of wheat, except the corn of wheat fall into the earth. How's it fall into the earth? By itself, alone. But this lesson was so important. And Jesus had the Last Supper. He washed the feet of the disciples. Peter, he came to Peter, and Peter's like, No, no, don't wash my feet. He didn't understand. Spiritual application. We've been walking on a road, the wrong road, dirty road. Our feet are filthy. Jesus spiritually washing us and putting us in a clean path, the right path. You have to have that washing because it's a washing of the heart, spiritually, literally spiritually. And he asked them, he says, so who I, who am I? Who am I? If I wash, if I wash your feet, who am I? Verse 13, John chapter 13. He call me Master and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, sister, now brother, don't miss the application here. It's not a ritual. It's not a service at church. This is a lifestyle that you carry out in the street, in the city, in a country, in the mission field. Washing the feet, the dirty, stinky feet, Agrigorian society, they probably had literal chunks of ranch animal manure on their feet. He washed it off. Verse 15, John 13, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant, we are servants, 
Verse 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Wow. So John thirteen seventeen says, You're going to be happy if you do what? Wash your neighbor's dirty feet and be a servant. And there's people in the world saying, serve me. Some people in the world oppressing others. Civil wars. Social unrest. Treat us right. Some people blind. Doesn't matter how you treat other people. Step on them. That's the way of the world. But the people on the other side of the world, just they want to be on top so they can step on the other person. Just a demonstration of Satan's kingdom. And God's saying, come over here. Be ye separate and not. Don't touch the unclean thing. But let's finish here. So Jesus is saying, if you want to be happy, you have to be a servant. His last words to the disciples at the supper table, the last supper table, before they got up and started walking into Gethsemane. This is how close he is to the crucifixion, folks. We're talking hours. In fact, he's maybe several minutes, a 30-minute walk, hour walk to Gethsemane. I don't know. But in verse 31, John 13:31, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. There's that word again. Chapter 12, we had it. Chapter 13, we have it. Now, verse 31, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children... Yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this, by this, John thirteen thirty five. So all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So there you have it, folks. God's kingdom is made up of people who live in the mountains and people who live in the desert, people who live on one side of the river, the dark-skinned people and the light-skinned people, people who have different hair than you and different eyes than you and different nose and different lips, and it's going to be made up of all nations. So if you hate somebody or you're in one group or another and you take position with one or another, and God's group is made up of every group, the ones you like and the ones you don't like, that leaves you on the outside. We must serve God and serve all of man. But when we live in the position that God put us in, we work as servants as Jesus. Now, some of our minds, you might be stuck in the upper room. But Jesus said, the hour has come. Glorify thy son. The hour, the real hour, was a crucifix. Was a cru- was a crucifixion, and so in order for the church to finish the work, the people are going to have to go through a Gethsemane, and a Via Dolorosa, the walk to Calvary, the painful walk, persecuted, spit on, slapped, half his beard pulled out, punched. Kicked, 
abused, insulted, shamed, tortured. That's the path. That's why the church, when we study, it's not a joking matter. It's solemn. It's serious. It's sober. And Jesus said, and Jesus said, it's a sober matter, so we must watch and pray. And when you have to, fast and pray, because otherwise we won't have the strength. We won't have the nerve. And so unless we fast and pray, watch and pray like the disciples were told to in Gethsemane, but they didn't. Oh, no, you can't make it. But if you pray like Jesus in Gethsemane first and surrender, then you can walk that walk on the Via Dolorosa, that painful road of Calvary. Then you can walk that walk and be crucified. And when we're crucified, I am crucified with Christ. Yet I live, not I, but Christ liveth in me by the life of the Son of God, by our faith in the Son of God, by the power of Jesus. We overcome, we glorify God, and then shall the end come because we've demonstrated to the world the love of God they see that we love every other man, woman, boy, girl, race, kindred, tongue, people. They look over and we bear witness. We give testimony that Jesus is the Christ. That the God of heaven and his law is a righteous, good, holy law. And wow, these people, they've been through all that, all that spit, all those slaps, all the kicking. And they're happy. You know what's going to happen, sister. You know what's going to happen, brother. Just like James, the brother of John, who wrote this, what we just read. He looked so good to his executor after he had dragged him behind a horse, tied up for 20 miles. He was battered and bruised and scratched and bloody. And then he chopped his head off. And John looked so good. The executioner confessed. and said, I'm going to be a Christian. He was so committed. And the Romans, they chopped his head off too. But he gave glory. John James gave glory to God. And that glory, if you die, will bring people into the kingdom. But... God wants a generation now who will get dragged behind the horse, but they'll live. They'll be more like John. He got thrown in the pot of boiling oil, and he was just staring at them. And then they feared to kill him because they saw the power of God was with them. And so they locked him up on Patmos. And there... He wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is a story that you and I are supposed to live. And remember, John and James wanted to drink the cup and have the seat on the right and the left hand. And the seat on the right and the left hand is for those who it has been prepared for by the Father. And Revelation 3, as we just saw, says who's going to sit on the right and the left. So, sister, I ask you again. Brother, I ask you again. Do you want to glorify God? I hope you say yes. Confirm that with God. Pray to Him. Commit yourself to Him every day. And He'll empower you. Let's say a word of prayer and close. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the offer you've given to us. We want to accept it. We ask for it in our lives. We need that power. We can't make it without your power. So empower us, Lord. Be faithful to your word and make us
strengthen us to be faithful to you, that we might glorify your name for each on the line. Even though they may not have been Christians, lead them up that path and down the road and strengthen them. And those of us who've already known some of this, give us that resolve and fortitude to continue on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is Dr. Courtney Jackson. My ministry is Revelation of Him. You can find us on the web at www.revelationofhem.org. Remember, this is a ministry of faith. You can call me at 909-557-5618 if you'd like to support this ministry and or deposit directly in our account at Bank of America, account number 21486-32228. Until uh, two weeks from now, God be with you all. Amen. Just really thank you. Thank the Holy Spirit for giving us these messages. I think about the text, um, the fear God and give glory to him, for this is the whole duty of man. So, again, uh, Dr. Courtney uh, Jackson, we thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate um, these messages we have been receiving every other week. We thank God. I will close out the mid discord and strife. A voice was heard from the wilderness, a voice startling and stern, yet full of hope. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Thank you again, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. Someday.